bring in a big chunk and just sort of slice it off. So, right. But yeah, so you still get the same experience, but just in a different way. Oh so, yeah, well I mean, yeah. making making all these truffles by hand is not an easy thing, and no. I just I just knocked over something over there, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we'll be a, oh let's cut that, or let's cut that. This podcast is a first. We had the opportunity to be a part of Whiskey Live and we took advantage by interviewing as many people as we could in a short amount of time. We hope you enjoy this episode that combines 10, five to eight minute individual podcasts into one. Big thanks to the folks at Whiskey Live for letting us attend and bring you this content in addition to episode 102 where Brent gave a seminar on creating Al Young's 50th anniversary bottle. You can get information for Whiskey Live and the cities that will take place next at whiskeyliveusa.com. That's whiskey with a Y and not an E. As you all know, we held a giveaway on Facebook for some flask from Four Roses, and the winners are Dan Arflack and Jason Fritz. We also had a third flask giveaway for our supporters on Patreon, and that winner is John Beard. Congratulations to all of you, and I'll get in touch with you very soon to figure out shipping details. Remember to follow and like us on Facebook, because we're also pushing out outtakes and bloopers on there every single week. Thanks again for everyone that's taken the time to write those iTunes reviews and a special shout out to Robbie Reed 520 who said, I had no idea there were actually good bourbon podcasts out there and this is the best one there is. Thanks Robbie and to everyone else supporting the show. Enjoy this week's episode. So we're here at Whiskey Live 20, wow, what year is it? 2017 17. right now. And so uh, we're here with Fred No. Uh, the man behind everything with Jim Beam, you know, he's been a past guest on the show before. So uh, what's been going on lately? It's just hanging in there, you know, having a little fun with Bourbon Affair this week. A lot of visitors come to Kentucky and hanging out. Yeah. Going to events around all the different distilleries and Yeah, when we were talking good. yeah, we were talking about when we were really churching this up, you know, you do uh, you do your bourbon inspired barbecue, right? Right. So we did that Thursday night. So kind of tell me about it. Like what are you doing in your barbecue sauce or what are you doing that makes it super unique or anything crazy like that? First thing we do is we, you know, have a little bourbon tasting, get everybody tuned up a little bit and taste get them greased up, right? Taste a little yeah. bourbon and then we'll uh, cook some pork chops on the grill, flambe them with Booker's bourbon. And then uh, have fried chicken, and then have some good country music to go with it. So you a, a grilling guy, or like a smoking guy? Like what we do you do? Both. Yeah. We do both. We were grilled the other night. Yeah. I we mean, do both. I guess. I mean, uh, are you a big smoker guy too? Oh, like yeah. you got yeah. you got one at home? Like yeah, me uh, and my son. We smoke. We cure hams. Make sausages. We play around all kinds of stuff. Oh man. So like, what are your, what's your favorite thing you do on the smoker then? Like what's we do, the, we do the ribs, and then our Boston butts are pretty good too. Oh man. I, Sounds good to me. So I mean, I guess uh, are you what you uh, you mix any kind of bourbon in there in your sauce? Oh yeah, we got a little like bourbon in the well, yeah, in what's, the sauce. What's your secret recipe? I guess I tell a lot of us put a little bit in the cook. Yeah, that's the main thing. Put the good bourbon in the cook. Right, and then you know the, the food's going to be good. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we throw a little bit of Knob Creek in our barbecue sauce. And then we'll flambe the pork chops with Booker's bourbon right. after they're done. Oh, that sounds delicious. So, I mean, uh, there's been uh, there's some good things. Like, I know Knob Creek 25th anniversary is coming out. Kind of kind of talk about that one a little bit. That's going to be a single barrel, uncut, unfiltered uh, Knob Creek version. Yeah. Which kind of combine what my dad did. You know, he liked you know the Knob Creek, and he did the uncut. And then single barrel is something I kind of brought to the Knob Creek brand. So we're combining the thinking of... My father and me both. Right. Now, how is that different than, like, the, um, I guess, uh, there were three batches of the other Knob Creek, the uh, All right, this is, this is not cut. or something uh, like that? Yeah. 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 yeah so, see, this was, that was 2001, but what we did. Oh, 2001. That's what On this thinking. one, we didn't, didn't cut it at all. So it comes right out of the barrel. Each barrel gets bottled independently, and there's no water added at any point. Right. So, you know, different bottles be different proofs on the shelf together. Well, good deal. So, uh. I mean, we talked about Booker's Rye a lot last time, and I mean that that kind of flew off the shelves. Well, yeah. I mean, it did really well. Our Basil Hayden Rye is doing really well too. So. Seen, yeah, that's one thing. I guess let's talk about that for a minute because that's something that's new that's hitting the shelves. I guess where was your um, what was the idea behind launching the Basil Hayden Rye? Was it like there's a there's a new market we can go with here? Or is it well, uh, you yeah. know, Basil Hayden is a high rye bourbon, you know, but yet we want to make it very approachable and easy to drink. So we did the same thing with the Basil Hayden rye. We brought a nice rye whiskey, and then we can made it very approachable and easy to drink so it doesn't overpower the palate. 
in the Basil Hayden family. Right. And that's, I mean, because it, it's at a pretty low proof. I think, what, like 80, 80, 80, yep. 80 like yep, Basil 80. Hayden, right? Right, exactly. So, uh, I mean, you guys seem like you're, you're wanting to expand your rye footprint. Is is there something that is uh, in the, in the, in the, you know, I guess in the making here? Is it, no, uh, we're, we've been making rye for many, many years. And it's just now the popularity is starting to peak a little bit. So we're, we're just releasing more of what we got. So why couldn't you think uh, take like some of the Basil Hayden and make that like a Booker's like uncut you know whatever kind of rye as a as a full product line? Is that something you might? Well, be thinking Basil about? Hayden is uh, eighty proof, very approachable. So if you start going uncut, you're kind of going away from what Basil Hayden's all about. And a loyal Basil Hayden fan, they're used to very approachable, oh, yeah. easy to drink. So that's why we kind of got the guardrails on Basil Hayden to keep it in that segment, so it doesn't disappoint the. The existing fans of Basil Hayden. Oh, but you got you got a lot of fans that are big Booker's fans too. Right? Oh yeah, they got they can drink Booker's in, yeah, you know. Yeah, right. You want Booker's, you go Booker's. You want Basil Hayden, you go Basil Hayden. <laughs> you know, that's why we kind of keep the families, you know, I keep them the same. That's what makes them what they are. Right. So I guess uh, what's been your highlight of this week that's been going on? Uh, you know, you've you you know with Jim Beam is uh, you've had a lot of stuff going on this week. So anything that stands out, a cut above the rest? Well, we had a ride on the dinner train. Uh, Bourbon Express. We had a little lunch on the Kentucky Bourbon Dinner Train there in Bardstown. Yeah. Went down to the plant, show people around, came back to Bardstown. That was kind of cool. Yeah. So a lot of people had never ridden a dinner train before, so that was good. I'm sure you got to meet all kinds of new people this oh, week. Oh, yeah. It's been good. We've had them all over the world. It's been yeah. great. I'm sure you didn't hold back. You're no, just regular no. yourself, right? We're just having fun and have to travel on this one. <laughs> that's and stay that's home. the best one, right? Heck yeah, it's right here in Kentucky, right at our home. Well, that works out pretty well for you then. So far, it's been great. Well, it's going awesome. to finish it up good tonight. Oh, yeah. Uh, I want to get, let you get back to what you're doing. I want to say thanks again for coming on here and Talk talking to us. Thanks. So, appreciate have a good it. One. Welcome back. We're here again at Whiskey Live uh, 2017, and I'm sitting here next to the Cooper's Craft booth, and I've got Greg, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce his last name. Roshkowski. Roshkowski. So, uh, Greg, give us an idea of, of what your your occupation is at, at part of Cooper's Craft, at, I guess the, the overall part of Brown Foreman, whatever it is, right? All right. Um, I'm the barrel ambassador for the Cooper's Craft brand, and that's kind of a fancy way of saying I get to go out and represent all the people at the Cooperage who make the whiskey barrels for Brown Foreman and their fine whiskeys. So Brown Foreman's the only distillery company in the world that owns its own new barrel Cooperage and the Cooper's Craft brand pays homage to that as well. So I guess what makes Cooper's Craft either unique, right? Because I, I, we, we, did a, we did a podcast a little while ago with uh, Michael Nelson of okay. Brown Foreman, right? You know, and, and he, we, we kind of hinted at the fact that, oh, I think there, you know, there's going to be a new bourbon coming out that's going to be all about basically recognizing all everybody that goes into the just the, uh, right, as you could say, the craft of being a cooper, right? Correct, and that's what this bourbon's all about. It's about paying homage to those people. It's a little lower proof, 82.2, um, than some of our other Brown Foreman whiskeys, as well as the grain bill has a little less rye. It's only 10% rye, so it's more of an everyday drinking whiskey, so paying homage to the people who do the hard work every day. So I guess talk a little bit more about the brand and, and kind of what's that what's that overall spiel you give a lot of people when you when you get to go and give the give those like thirty minute presentations talking about the you know all this sort of stuff. Well, first of all, I'm a barrel nerd by heart, so I've been doing this for you know and the pride that people take in it. So first, we teach them about the craft. You know, every barrel's different; it's raised a different way. Every piece is different. So talk about the people that do that and how much pride they put into that, and then as well as what's the barrel do for the whiskey. So the co all the color comes from the barrel. Over half the flavor comes from the barrel. So we educate them about, you know, the toasting levels, the charring levels, and what that does to the different flavor profiles as well. So with, with Cooper's Craft, very long toasting process, bringing out those vanillas and sugars into the wood. A little less char, so it's not going to be a very heavy whiskey. It's going to be kind of light. And that's how, you know, Chris Morris, the master distiller, kind of, and and I would say like the the toasting process is like a it's like a brown foreman staple right yes. and 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 I guess talk a little bit more you know we've talked about it before in the podcast but let's get ready to refresh like what does toasting uh, ultimately do to the final product so toasting brings all the sugars and caramels in the wood closer to the surface where the whiskey is going to spend its time so what we're trying to do is make sure all that sugary vanilla flavor gets into the whiskey so we don't talk about a color or toasting level what we talk 
we have a proprietary process where it's all about duration what the temperature is and how long that wood stays in there. So the color might vary if you're looking at it in the natural light, but how long it's been on and the temperature, that consistent temperature is what we're really looking at. A lot of old barrel making um, or uh, more manual, they'll sit it on an open flame and on Mondays they'll hang around, they're a little slow from the weekend. Right get a little heavier toast. Friday they want to get out of there, they're flipping the barrels and they're going out. Yeah. So what we've done at Brown Foreman is really focus on that consistency, time and temperature for that to really get into the whiskeys. That's real cool because I mean we actually had the opportunity to go and visit the cooperage and go and tour it and it's it's something that's a it's a rare sight just to be able to go to a cooperage and be able to see it. Right? Yeah it's an amazing place the sounds the sights and the smell you know you just can't recreate you can look at video and things like that but like I said the sounds and the smells and just how it operates is very it unique operation. Well, I mean, it's it's a factory at the end of the day, right? But I mean, it's 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 a well-oiled machine. I think uh, I mean, how how fast can a barrel get through there? If you I know I know they do it in like stations, but if you were to say like if we would put in a barrel and try to time gap this, like what would you say? Well, from raising to finish, it'll still take about 45 minutes just because you've got to heat it up to bend it and then the toasting as well as the charring process takes that time. I guess if you could speed lap some of those processes, right. you could, you know, you probably do it in 2 or 3 minutes. The guys that raise barrels every day or gal do it in about 45 seconds. So they're raising a barrel, you know, they're raising 300 barrels a day. So that uh, you and I, four or five minutes, we'd be looking at something that might look about half finished like this right. one over here. So I uh, think one of the coolest things is definitely when you're taking the tour and I mean, they save it for the last for the reason, right? And it's it's when the fire starts going up through the barrels, the actual charring process. I mean, talk about like, what, what, what's happening there in regards of like how much heat and like the char level that's going into Cooper's Craft and all this other kind of stuff. Yeah, so when they, by the time the barrel gets there, it's already three or 400 degrees because it's been coming out of the toasting. So it doesn't take very long for it to flame up. So we're gonna run that full flame, basically depending on the product, Cooper's is gonna run about 45 to 50 seconds on that open flame. We're not looking for a very heavy char. But that charring really, it doesn't, people think it adds color to it, it really doesn't. What it does is basically serve as a filtration and takes a lot of the a lot of the acid and tannic and things like that out of the whiskey so you can taste those woody, sugary flavors much more clear. So I'm gonna take a take a drink of this real quick. I guess I'm gonna sniff it. I guess what are the, some things that I, I should be getting out of it? You should a lot of the vanillas and sugars, um, the wood sugars. Um, like I said, a little more, a little more of that sweetness of the corn because you don't have as much rye. You definitely see the sweetness. Yeah, in there. and you'll have more the the fruits more prevalent than like I said the spices would be. It's a very smooth finish at 82 two proof. You don't have that back throat finish kind of thing. It's, it's very approachable, especially for somebody that maybe like just getting into whiskey or something exactly. like that. Exactly. And that's that's kind of what the, what we're shooting for. Nobody's going to care if, if Cooper's and Coke is what you're drinking or Cooper's and Cola, you know, introductory. It's your first one on the rocks or with water. It's very light. And like I said, that finish on the front of the tongue versus the back of the throat that some people have struggle with when they're saying, oh, I've got to try Burma. I didn't like it. Yeah, I mean, I think the I think the proof level actually it, it does well for for what it is, only because uh, there's really not a whole lot of ones that are on the market. Other than maybe like Basil Hayden might be something reg relatively close, right? But you go a little bit higher in proof, right, rather than Basil, and and I think it, it definitely gets some of that that market when people you know they want to get into it and they start drinking it neat. This is an easy one that's very approachable for a lot of people. Yeah, and that's the thing. We've only introduced it in eight states, all in the South. And so a lot of times in the summer, the, the heat, you know, people switch away from whiskeys and into lighter drinks. And it's like, this is something they can switch to. It's a little lighter on the front porch in the morning. I, I'd say, you know what, it's funny you say that because when I think about it, I, I see a lot of people and they're like, they're at the beach and they pour themselves like a, uh, uh, you know, like a, a Glen Karen a stag and I'm just like it's like 130 proof yeah. like that's that's a that's a tough thing to do on the beach exactly. but this this could possibly be like the beach bourbon right yeah you know? yeah like I said it's perfect to sip ever you know like I said cool refreshing light it's good 
Well, it's fantastic. I mean, I think for, for what it is, I think it's it's great. So you said that you're only in eight states right now. Is there like future distribution that you're looking to do? And yeah, and, then, and rolling out? out. But we really want to make sure we're entrenched in those eight states. It's also been released in the military, some of the uh, bases and things like that. Get a little broader um, dispersion. But we really want people who know bourbon, who can appreciate what we're trying to do with this, to really hook on before we spread too rapidly. I mean, that's that's a really unique thing to say that we're going to put it in the bases. I never would have thought about yeah. that, right? Yeah, because... I mean, it's, yeah, that's a whole different channel. Gets all different exposure from people all over. You know, like I said, your your army and navy people are from all over the country. It, I was about to say, then they go back home and they're like, "Damn it, I can't find it." Right, right. Exactly. And now, and now I got to call you, and I got to figure out how can I get a bottle, right? Yeah, have, have to know somebody in the south or make a friend in the military from the south at some point. So. Yeah. Well, Greg, this is a pleasure. Thank you so much for chatting with us today. Uh, and if anybody wants to get in touch with you, like, how would they be able to do that? Uh, basically, go on the Cooper's Craft website, and they'll have a, basically my contact information's on there. So, Perfect. All thank right. you again. All right. Thank you. We're back again at Whiskey Live. This time, I've got Joe Beatrice. Am I saying the right name, Joe Beatrice? All right, cool. So Joe is the founder of Barrel Bourbon. Uh, the winner of Best Bourbon of San Francisco Spirits Award in, uh, this past year. So, Joe, I mean, you got to probably be on cloud nine a little bit right now, right? We're pretty excited about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah we are. Um, it was, it's been, uh, it's been really a lot of fun, and um, and we were, we were, we were surprised. I mean, we were really delighted that it happened, and um, and we're glad that people recognize it and love it. So, I mean, what do you, what you guys submit that you think was like? either a cut above the rest or anything like that or even like completely different than like say as we we're sitting here batch 7b or batch any of these other ones or because there's always people that say like i love batch six or i love batch nine whatever it is like so what, what do you think was something about special about batch 11 that just did it or is it just help it's all luck at the end of the day right <laughs> well we we, we we tend to uh blend for specific properties and every batch is, is different, and we try to highlight something different within each of them. Uh, what's unique about 11, I think, is that it's extremely balanced from beginning to end. There is nothing that jumps out at you as jarring or, uh, or, or, um, or too predominant. It's just, it's just perfectly balanced. There's a really nice beginning. The rye is present in the middle, but it's not overpowering. And the finish is long, and the notes are lingering. It's right. just a beautiful whiskey. Um, yes. I've had the opportunity to try it. I, th I was very, I was very pleased. I think it was, I think it was fantastic. Uh, and now you're coming out with batch twelve, just right around the corner. I mean, I know I can't say like pick your favorite child, but I mean, how do you think this is stacking up against eleven? You know, it's kind of hard to, I mean, come around and you know try to release something that's that's going to compete with something that basically just won, you know, double gold, best bourbon, all this other kind of stuff. It is a tough act to follow, but we're professionals. Yeah. So we put that aside and just try to do the best thing we can on the next one. And uh, Batch 12 is, is um, it's a, it's an interesting one. It's a nine-year-old. Um, but there are, and there are a few uh, older barrels in here as well. Uh, it's a 108.5 proof, so it's actually the lowest um, cast, uh, cast strength product that we've, we've ever released. And so there are obviously low rick barrels. Right. Um, and what I, and this one, um, what I like about it is um, the rye notes, in contrast to batch eleven, are a little bit more predominant. So you really get it a little bit more. And the finish is very different. It's longer. Um, and there are a couple of chocolate notes at the very end that I think are quite nice. Um, and you know, so all through it, it really um, there's a, there's different things that are there. Um, I really like this. I think it's, um, we think that it came out terrific and hopefully people will think the same thing and uh, it is tough to follow that one. I, I think so too. I think, um, you know, if I remember my, my re I've got a bad memory already the way it is. Maybe it's because I drink too much, but you know, I remember 11, you know, having a little bit more of a, like a spicier, or like a little longer finish, but this one definitely has, as you said, a bit of that chocolate on the back. I can definitely get some of those chocolatey kind of caramelly kind of flavors that are that are kind of floating towards the back there. Now, the other thing that you guys got going on is pretty big news is is the uh, the distillery that you're building. So, kind of talk about that just a little bit. Well, that's been an overall very interesting experience. Uh, we're in the finals uh, stages of getting the DSP approved. 
and then we'll start the uh, the construction full bore. Um, right. It's you know it's a um, we're we're looking to one of the things that we're looking to do with this is uh, we're not going to replace what we're doing. Our model of finding and blending product is exactly what we're going to continue to do. And so essentially, Barrel Craft Spirits will be a customer of the Barrel Craft Spirits Distillery. We'll sell a lot of it, and the rest of it we'll keep, and when it's ready, we'll layer it into our product line. So it won't replace what we're doing, but it'll be one of the products, or a component of products that we'll produce when it's ready. Yeah, I was about to say, because uh, you got a long time until that, that when that first barrel is going to be ready, right? So you got, you, got, you got some time to fill right there, but I, I think, you know, and not only that is, we interviewed Trey Zoller one time, and uh, and he said, you know, we, we opened up this distillery, but we're actually paying more to distill our own stuff than we are to actually just go ahead and source it. So what was the thought? Is it just like, well, we need to own our own destiny or whatever it is to, to actually start building a distillery? Um, I'm not sure I'd agree with that. I think that actually... Um, after the cost of distillation and the aging, I think we're, we'll be ahead of the game in terms of buying source whiskey as far as the cost goes. Um, we're doing it because we can. Um, yeah. and, uh, and it was always what I wanted to do. I always wanted to have a distillery, but wanted to build a brand first. Yeah. Because it's, it is, as Trey said, it's hard to make money with distilling products. So and he's right about that. Uh, and, uh, and so we're going to just go with it and... See, see, I mean, I, I don't think you guys have to hope for the best, right? I think what you guys are putting out is a completely solid product. Uh, I mean, what, I guess talk about what's the what's the thought process when you're picking the barrels and the blending, right? Because uh, this is this is you're one of the very unique brands that like you don't technically come out with a whole lot of single barrels, right? Like the, your 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 best stuff is all in these batches, right? So what what makes a lot of these um, more desirable to, to you per se? That's actually a good point. We do single barrels, but we're careful not to impact the batch. So we don't take all the best ones out. We take very good ones out and the ones I think are best, but don't uh, leave enough so that we can create create um, a good batch. We are, we start with uh, an idea of what we want to achieve. Um, we taste through a selection of barrels we've made and then group them into different properties and then see how they blend together. And then we, when we get it just right, we know we will put it in the bottle. For example, we've been working on the rye for a while now, and um, we're blending. And until we get the right combination of barrels together, we won't. We will just simply won't put it out there. And I was about to say, is it say is it, is it a science experiment every single time? Because a lot of a lot of big companies they've got it down to a science, right? And they say like, all right, we know the warehouse, we know the ages, we know these things. We can do some taste tests, just to make sure we might reject a barrel or two. But they, they know like what they're gonna be pulling in, and they can have a continual flow of product. But with your different batches, like they're they're continually. I, I'm not gonna say they're they're not the same, but they're not far different either, right? There's there's subtle nuances and differences between every single one. So is that really like the the idea and the goal is to be kind of like um I don't know whether it's a uh, Beanie Babies or erector, uh, collector sets or whatever it is. Like you got to, you got to get the whole batch, right, to to do whatever it is. So, I, I guess kind of talk about that of, of having just the subtle nuances and differences between all these different batches too. Um, and not just have like just one product line, right? I mean, because a lot of people are trying to do that. They'll they'll blend it together, have one great product line, they'll push it out. But you you creating something that's just subtly different every single time. Well, a couple of things. Um, First of all, if you did the same thing every time, it's not that much fun. Okay. So we get we get to we get to play in a world where where what we find that we like, we actually can put in the bottle. Um, the thinking behind it was uh, I, I don't know about you, but I, I don't. There's a I have a fatigue of drinking the same thing over and over again. I tend to I tend to ask what's new, and and that that was sort of the at the core of what, what uh, precipitated us doing this. I want to be able to create something different every time that we put it in the bottle. Um, and you're right, some of them are close, but some of them are really different. Some of the profiles, if you look at 7.7B versus 8 or 9, they're entirely different. Or if you go to 10, where it's a little bit softer, it's an Indiana bourbon, it's a little bit softer one, um, they're, they're all there. Um, so it, it, it is our intent to uh, to create something different, uh, the fact that people like to collect them is just a plus. Right. Uh, but but the goal always was just to put something that 
we really loved in the bottle and let people have that experience themselves. Right. So the promise is you may not, you may have favorites one over another, but you're not going to be disappointed in the quality. Right. It just doesn't make it in the bottle. Awesome. Joe, I'm going to say thank you again for coming on. What I swear, one of these times where you're back here in Louisville, we're going to get you on. We're going to do a full-blown, hour-long we'll podcast with you, okay? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, so I want to say thank you again. Uh, you know, if anybody does want to get in touch with you, they got a question, how do they do that? If they got Twitter, or they got email, like how, how are you going to do that? Any way at all. Uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or just go to Contact the Bourbon. I see every one of them. So. You can give out your address like so it knock on your door, right? No, I'm <laughs> just on, on it. It is on my card. <laughs> and I do answer the emails. Awesome. So, Joe, thank, thank you, so you again. Appreciate it. Yep, thank you. We're back again at Whiskey Live, but uh, right now we're at a little bit of a different spot. You know, we, we, we talked about it uh, on a podcast before, and we, we're venturing out a little bit, right? It's, uh, we're very much a Kentucky-focused kind of kind of podcast we uh, you know we, we we live here in louisville in kentucky and we definitely have a i don't know what you want to say uh fascination or maybe a stigma or whatever it is right so uh but we're with balconies right now so uh winston tell us a little bit about balconies and texas whiskey and you know kind of what you all are doing so we're out of waco texas um not the most likely place to start a distillery, but hey, that's where our distillers lived, and they didn't feel it was necessary to go anywhere else to start something really cool, yeah. authentic, and genuine. Yeah. So they, they kind of met in a homebrew club, um, and they found themselves drinking a lot of single malt whiskey. And maybe it was uh, part naivety and part cockiness, but they said, hey, we know the first step of making malt whiskey really well, because malt whiskey is basically beer that died and went to heaven. And so they said, let's make some. So they bought this tiny little building underneath a bridge in downtown Waco. They spent the greater part of a year building it out into a craft whiskey distillery by hand. They had to fabricate their own heat exchangers and condensers, tear out a couple walls, do all the piping and plumbing themselves. So it was a very much DIY project for them. But a year later in 2009, we finally started distilling. We started making blue corn whiskey. We started making rumble, which is a sugar, honey, and fig spirit. And uh, we, we got some really great press and awards. Finally, our single malt came out, which is the whole idea behind it. Uh, I think around 2010, got some massive awards from that. And then, uh, yeah, you know, we've always just had this kind of focus that ingredients really matter in whiskey. And we want to try and represent them in the final product. So like Baby Blue is a great example of that, of course. It's 100% corn. It smells like corn. It tastes like corn. Um, but really, the, our angle is to, to create something new and uh, more or less start a Texas whiskey tradition. Distilling in Texas is kind of a new thing. It's a very burgeoning industry right now. I was about now. to say, I mean, you've got you guys, I know Garrison. I mean, there's a few ones that are starting to put themselves on the map in regards yeah. of what they're doing. Yeah, definitely. Um, but, you know, funny enough, it, it even though Texas and whiskey sound like they go hand in hand, like us and Garrison, we were like the first two whiskey distilleries in Texas almost ever. There's some like moonshining things you can read about uh, that happened during Prohibition and maybe previous to Everybody's that. Got a story, but there's right? not really been like an established or legitimate industry for whiskey or even distilling in general in Texas. So um, we want to make something that is, is is very authentic, very genuine, but also reflects where it's from. So we're not just trying to do bourbon and rye like all the other craft distillers are out there. We're trying to draw upon the flavors of Texas and then apply those to whiskey. So what's up? Give me a flavor of Texas. I'm thinking, I'm thinking hot sauce like Texas Pete, but it kind of give me an idea. Well, like, what's okay, a flavor so, of Texas? Uh, Brimstone is a really excellent example. When we set out to make single malt, one of our first ideas was to actually make a peated single malt. But after a little bit of thinking, we're like, okay, peated whiskey does not really fit into the flavors of Texas. There isn't really any peat in Texas, you know? So... We scrapped the idea of doing a peated malt, but we thought, okay, smoke is definitely still a part of the Texas flavor. So instead, what we did is we made an oak smoked whiskey. I'm actually getting, I mean, is that, I'm, is that, I'm getting some of that oaky, smoky kind of That's really more from the bit. barrel char and anything yeah. else. But when it comes to brimstone, we take the new make from our blue corn whiskey. So it's the same thing all the way up until after distillation. And then we apply a secret smoking process to the whiskey using Texas scrub oak, which is very commonly used as like a barbecue wood in Texas. I was about to say, I was like, you know, you've got a lot of great barbecue in Texas. I'm sure I, I'm just surprised you wouldn't have a, like a, what are they? I mean, they're big, like oil drums almost, right? That they, they basically like tear apart and turn into, uh, turn into barbecues, right? All so. different kinds of ways. Yeah. You know, we get a little ingenuous sometimes. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, brimstone is like a barbecue in a bottle, you know? 
But if you wanted to like maybe look at it from a slightly more Epicurean standpoint, Baby Blue is 100% blue corn, and it's a corn whiskey, not a bourbon, so it's not trying to be an oak bomb like a lot of bourbons do. Um, it's really trying to represent the quality of the grain more than anything else. And if you think about it, uh, corn is very ingrained, pun intended, in Texas cuisine. You know, you've got tortillas, masa, chips, all these different things that involve corn. And blue corn is definitely something that has a very kind of like, you know, south, southwest vibe to it. You guys would say almost like an Indian culture of blue corn Yeah, sometimes. well, we actually started buying the corn originally from a Hopi Indian reservation. Oh, see, there we go. Unfortunately, they're not in the agriculture business, so we could not source the quantity that we needed from them. Um, but they were actually kind enough to supply us with some seed stocks and then hook us up with some farmers in the area uh, that could grow the same corn for us. So it's the same corn, it's just not literally grown by the Native Americans anymore. Right. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very full flavored corn, uh, very rich, got a kind of nutty character to it, and then we roast the corn on top of that to kind of accentuate those flavors even more. And then we make whiskey out of it. And what you get is something that smells and tastes a lot like what it was made from, instead of just the barrel it was aged in. Right. I think it's it's been, it's pretty. I mean, it's a great story. Um, you know, Texas whiskey is definitely putting itself on the map lately. Yeah. Uh, you know, between you all, I, Fred Minnick gave gave you guys uh, a, a pretty big uh, thumbs up not too long ago, yeah. uh, which was which you know, and Fred's not an easy one to impress, right? And I, I thought that was that was impressive. And that's why I was like, well, let's just go talk to these guys, okay? Because I'm sure they have a great story to tell. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I mean, so did you come all the way from Waco for this event too? I did. I did. Well, technically, I just moved to Dallas last week, so okay. still I came from Texas. Yes. Yeah. That's well, a one-way flight from DFW on. Exactly. Uh, there you go. Yeah, so that's, that's very not easy too bad. to get here. Yeah. Well, real cool. So, Winston, I want to say thank you again for kind of giving us the rundown of everything that happening at Balconies. Uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, how would they be able to do that, or how are they can get hands on their bottles? Like, how far is your distribution? Just talk about that real quick. Uh, we're in about 12, maybe 14 states right now, primarily focused on the East Coast with uh, California, Illinois, and now Kentucky as well, too. Uh, we've actually been distributed here in Kentucky for a while, but we just switched distributors, so kind of like getting ready to relaunch here, basically. Um, but So not huge availability, but we have grand plans for expansion. Uh, we hope to go national eventually, and then we'll start looking at international markets as well. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, you can follow me on Twitter. It's just at Balconies Winston, and my email is just Winston at BalconiesDistilling.com, and I'm, I'm always happy to hear from fans or people that are just curious about Balcones or people that just want to talk whiskey, you know? Awesome. Again, Winston, appreciate it. My pleasure. So this time we're here at 1792 with another good friend of the show. You know, we've got Josh Hollifield. He was here talking to us a lot about uh, 1792, all the releases, the process. We even got to do a tour behind the scenes. So, Josh, what's been happening since the last time we talked? A lot's going on. Uh, busy and busy and busy. Um, we see our, our single barrel program. We talked a little bit about it last time. It was really taking off. Um, and then, of course, with Kentucky's birthday last week, June 1st, 225th anniversary. Of course, we had that limited edition come out, a 10-year-old uh, 225th anniversary edition, 1792. Yeah, you really just wanted to jump into that, right? So I want to talk about that one a little bit, right? So so it was it was Kentucky's 225th anniversary. I, I mean, as far as I know, you're the only ones that put out something that had a, had something sort of commemorative for it. Uh, it almost like snuck underneath the radar of a lot of people too, right? It did. We didn't put a lot of press behind it coming out of the gate. Um, because we wanted to hold it special. Of course, 1792 is named after the year Kentucky became a state. So um, we put that out. Um, it sold out pretty quick in the market. Uh, although the gift shop is going to have a little bit every month through the end of the year. So there's also something special about the proof, isn't there? It is. So it came out a little bit odd proof. Of course, anybody that's familiar with the 1792 brand knows that our proofs are pretty random. Um, so it was unique proof. It came out at 92.15 proof. The 92, of course, significant of 1792, and then the 1-5, as Kentucky was the 15th state in the nation. See, it, you guys are, you think, something was happening behind the scenes there, and you guys are like, well, we'll think of something unique here, right? Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, you guys also have a new master distiller that's been announced since the last time we were there, right? John Hargrove, he uh, took over the reins after Ken Pierce retired uh, last May. He's been doing a great job. Uh, we've got some, some nice things coming in the hopper next year, so. Well, I mean, it's... Everybody loved the port finish, right? So any any sign of that ever coming to life? 
port will re reappear in 2018. There you go. So you heard it here first, right? So that's that's super exciting because everybody seems to love that. Now, I actually have another one of your limited releases here in my hand, which is the uh, the high rye. Kind of talk about the difference between this high rye and really what you're trying to do in the experimentation with some of these like finished barrels. Okay. Maybe well, finished or different recipes so or whatever they are. High rye, um, most of the other products that we produce, whether it's the port finish, the single barrel, small batch, or, or foolproof, they all start at the same recipe. The high rye is a little bit different recipe. It's got 30% more rye in it than our original recipe. So honestly, when it came out, I thought it was going to be a crazy, spicy, big rye. But when you taste that, what do you taste? I taste it. I mean, there, you do have a little bit of spice on the back end, right? But it's, it's subtle, right? It's definitely subtle in regards to the spiciness because when you think of high rye, you're thinking of something that's just like, yeah, you might feel like a like it's a pepper packet, you know, and you just went off in your mouth or something like that. I don't really get that, right? I think I think it's very it's very well balanced for what it is. Exactly, it's very well balanced. And the one thing I noticed that I was surprised about how sweet it is on the front end, right? Because it's definitely sweeter than the regular 1792, um, our flagship, the small batch. Um, but it does carry as soon as that, that sweet starts to fade, you do start to get that rye. But it's a nice, very balanced uh, bourbon. And that should come out again this fall. So keep an eye out for it and pick it up. Yeah, I mean, because it's, it's one of those things that, well, this is a, a regular mash bill kind of thing, right? It's not, it doesn't have to be aged in a cer certain barrel or anything like that, right? So it makes it a little bit easier for the distribution or, I guess, the creation of it, right? Well, and then also give you a heads up to you and your listeners, there's not much of it left. So, so there you go, right? So whatever's been aging right now is kind of what, what's left of it at this point, right? I mean, is there ideas that say, like, all right, well, let's... I mean, I guess, is, is the experimentation train still rolling at 1792? Oh, yeah, or? yeah. So um, you should see some new expressions coming out next year in addition to the port finish, but I can't really... Right. Divulge what Please don't divulge, on. but... But, um, yeah, we're playing around with different stuff. We've got a couple different finishes that we've been playing around, also playing around with age. Um, you know, of course, you're always messing around with the location. So there's there's lots of dips, and that's a, the beautiful thing about bourbon. You know, there's so much that you can do to um, kind of transform those flavors that you're looking for. Right. I, and I guess what's been the, the highlight of you in the since we've talked last in regards of either releases or, like, traffic that's been happening at the distillery or anything like that? Because I, I, think, I think traffic's picked up quite a bit, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. We are um, usually up 20 to 30 percent year over year. Um, we will finish out the year 30,000 visitors, which for us, we started in May of 2011. So, you know, it's been great growth. And then just seeing the 1792 brand and all the new stuff we've been coming out with, you know, there are a lot of folks that don't have not been to Barton or are not aware of Barton, are not aware of kind of, of what this distillery does. And we have, you know, a lot of things going on. Our brands are growing. These new expressions have been very exciting. So it's just an exciting time to see what's happening going on out of Barton 1792. And one of the greatest things, you know, being part of the Sazerac family, you guys don't charge for uh, tours either, do you? We do not. We offer uh, tours six days a week. They're all free. Uh, so we have tours that go out and you'll see the basics of distillation in the warehouse on our regular tours. We also have a um, bushel to bottle tour, a little bit more in depth. Um, you'll see uh, fermentation, go a little bit deeper into the distillery. You'll also see the bottling line. But if you've got the extra time, come down Monday through Friday uh, for the estate tour. That will see all 196 acres that we have to offer. It's about two hours long. And of course, every tour includes a free tasting. Which, you can't say no to that, yeah, right? absolutely. Never I turn mean, down free bourbon. Yeah, I mean, well, last time I was there, I think we had the whole we had the whole lineup, right? We got to try uh, uh, some of the single barrel. We got to try the foolproof. And, I mean, foolproof is starting to really take off, too, from what I've seen. In regards to people that want to do barrel picks, they're like, yeah, let's just make it foolproof, right? Right. And, I mean, it... I was just checking to see how many barrel picks we did last year versus this year. And just from what the barrel picks that we've done on site is dub almost double what we did last year. Right. So, uh, and a lot of it has gone foolproof. Um, now you have the option of doing small batch, single barrel, or foolproof. Of course, the, the folks in the know, like you and me, are all looking for that higher proof, non-chill filtered stuff. Right. It, it's, for some reason, I mean, it just seems like what whiskey geeks really want nowadays. I, for me, I still think there's a lot of love there for the single barrel because, uh, I mean, I guess you could say, like, oh, make it foolproof and I'll dilute it down to what I want. But when you taste a single barrel versus a foolproof, I think there's uh, there's a huge difference in the flavor characteristics, right? I mean, uh, the foolproofs are, are they're, I mean, they're, they're 125. Is that what they are? 125, right? So every single time, you know, unless, unless you really know what you're getting into, uh, you might want to stick an ice cube in there. You might want to put a drop of water. But I have yet to come across a regular single barrel that I couldn't just drink just 
just straight and not just enjoy uh, as much as I would. Right? No, absolutely. And the thing about it, if you think about the small batch, single barrel, or foolproof, theoretically, they're all the same product when they're in the barrel. It's just how much water we're going to add. Now, the nice addition about the uh, foolproof, though, is that it's non-chill filter. So we're leaving all that flavor. So our foolproof 1792 is the purest form of that mash bill without just taking it directly from the barrel. Right. And the, the 125 is because you can't get rid of it at whatever the barrel proof that comes out of it? Correct. Right. So with our, with our bourbon, it's usually distilled about 140 proof. We have to cut it down legally, and go, we go in at the max at 125 proof. But because we age high in the warehouse, our proof goes up to 130, 140 range. So we're going to cut it back down to the original proof that it went in the barrel. So that's why we call it full proof, because we're taking it back to the full strength of what it was when it went in the barrel. Well, this is awesome. Hey, Josh, I want to say thank you again for taking a few minutes to sit here and talk to us, uh, give us an idea. You know, uh, I guess if anybody does want to get in contact with you, how do they do that? Either email or Twitter or whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. You can check us out on our webpage at 1792 distillery.com also on our Facebook page, or they can call the distillery gift shop at 502-331-4879. And you can see if the 225th anniversary is available for purchase that day. Correct. There you go. So you make sure you go check out those limited releases. And Josh, I want to say thank you again uh, for being here on the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast again. My pleasure. Thank you. So we're back again here at Whiskey Live. Uh, this time I've got John Foster uh, with Old Smooth Ambler Old Scout. So John, uh, you know we've had John Little on the show before, and we got we got to hear all the backstory behind Smooth Ambler and a lot of the different products. Uh, t tell tell everybody about uh, who you are and your role at, at uh, Smooth Ambler as well. So uh, John and I were best friends for about eight years before there even was a thought about a distillery, and I was in a different industry just like John was. Uh, my phone rang with John on the other end, and he said he was going to start a distillery with his father-in-law and needed a guy to help him distill and needed a, a sales guy. And um, that turned into me being uh, the third employee of Smooth Ambler Spirits. Right. And uh, here I am eight years later. You're here in Kentucky trying to push your West Virginia whiskey. Well, you know, <laughs> well, that's the thing, right, is, is John and I always said, you know, Kentucky was kind of our New York. You know, if we could make it here... We could make it anywhere. If we could, if we could do well selling whiskey in Kentucky, then California and New York and Florida and Texas and West Virginia and everywhere else would would sort of follow suit. We thought if, if we could do well here, and we have done well here. Kentucky is one of our top states. I mean, it's you know until you guys shut off the single barrel program. I mean, that was probably one of the hottest items on the market, right? It was something that. It was, uh, I mean, everybody loved it. Um, I think everybody's going to be excited when it comes back. Now, I kind of want to talk about some of the things that, you you know, we're, we're pouring here today. Uh, you've got your, your American whiskey and your contradiction. Just talk a little bit about the products themselves. Well, you know, so the American whiskey is, and, and we, we recognize that American whiskey as a category is a little odd. And, and the reason that it's odd is that most people that have an American whiskey, it's low proof. You don't know where it's from. Sometimes you don't know who's bringing it to you because there are not many established distilleries that have American whiskey. Usually it's like, you know, Jimmy's American whiskey. And yeah. it says, you know, produced and bottled in, you know, wherever. What makes it American? Anaheim, California. I should so, say, what makes it American well, rather, than, rather than just whiskey, right? Well, and the thing is, like, if, if you have a bourbon that's not officially bourbon, then you have two choices. You can call it American whiskey, or you can call it by its very sexy TTB designation, which is bourbon distilled or, or whiskey distilled from a bourbon mash. Oh, okay. So, so let's go ahead and just make it given easy. Given those two choices, most everybody goes with American whiskey. Our American whiskey, first of all, I think we've built a solid reputation on not lying to people about what we do and, and bringing you source whiskey. You might like it, you might not, but at least you weren't lied to about it. And our American whiskey is one part Old Scout bourbon, essentially, and one part this bourbon distilled in Tennessee that's aged in a rejuvenated barrel. So they clear out the inside of the barrel, they retoast it, and they fill it back up with a you know, bourbon mash whiskey. Now, that isn't the most clarity as if, as if we had a bourbon, but it's certainly among the field of American whiskeys about as clear as you get right. because you know it's the leper with the most fingers basically like 
We're telling you as much about it as possible, and it's brought to you by some guys that we hope that you can trust. And it's 99 proof and it's non-chill filtered. So we're trying to retain that purity as much as we possibly can, I given think, what it is. And I, I think so. I mean, especially in this market today, transparency is, is so key. Uh, just because you have a lot more informed consumers than you did even three years ago, right? Um, as people want to start reading the labels and actually understanding uh, whether they're DSP KY numbers or whether that whether they are sourced and where does it come from, and understanding even mash bills that go into these things, right? They they want to be more more informed of what they are actually drinking. We we agree, and we and we try and provide that as much as we can. And listen, Old Scout American whiskey is a five and a half year whiskey mixed with a twelve year old whiskey. So. Let's be generous and say you should drink like a six year. I mean, it's. <laughs> if we're going to average it out. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's not that we're not proud of it, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a workhorse whiskey. It's a Tuesday whiskey. It's yeah. not supposed to drink like our Old Scout 12 year old single barrel. I mean, it's just, it's a different animal. It's great in old fashioned, it's great on the rocks. It's great. I mean, listen, man, we're hanging out on my back porch. I'm drinking whiskey and gingers, and it's perfect for that. You know, and, and I feel the same way about other whiskeys. I feel the same way about J.W. Dan. I feel the same way about uh, Old Granddad Bonded. I mean, you, you need you need the finesse whiskey, and you need, for me, because I like to drink, you know, you, you need, like, the pig roast whiskey. You need the whiskey you can just drink as much as you want, mixed however you want without having to worry about it. And that was one of the beautiful things about the American whiskey for us is we could – return to that $35 price point. It's not that we're not proud of it, but it's it's not Old Scout single barrel. It fills the slot that it fills and that's what it should do. You know, we're not pretending that oh, here's this thing we've, you know, hobbled together and it's it should taste like a 20-year-old whiskey. It shouldn't. It should taste like a a really kick-ass 99 proof non-chill filtered 6-year-old whiskey. We hope you love the shit out of it. I, I love your I love your Tuesday whiskey kind of kind of mantra to be out of it because I mean there, there needs to be more Tuesday whiskeys out there as, as everybody tries to sit there and just keep pushing the envelope of I drink on Tuesday and, I yeah. drink on Wednesday and Thursday because yeah, everybody wants to keep pushing the envelope of experimentation and yeah. higher age and then we're gonna slap a you know hundred and fifty dollar two hundred fifty dollar price tag on it you know it, it, there's definitely is it's it, that hype is that hype train is starting to starting to roll pretty heavily well you know I equated to um, I mean, and, I, and I'm not knocking enthusiasts, and I'm not knocking people who have rare whiskey. I have a little in my house, both Smooth Ambler and otherwise, and so I get it. But I, I sort of equate it to um, high-end restaurants that have tasting menus, and you go in and they have like, you know, 12 course or eight course tasting menus, and you get, you know, a little piece of sea bass, you know, half the size of a playing card, and it's got a shaving of hazelnut on top of it like <laughs> and that's, that's gonna be 82 dollars, sir yeah. yeah well i didn't get this fat eating that like at, at a certain point i want to sink my teeth into something and i feel the same way about whiskey like we've all been over to somebody's house who has a really rare rare whiskey whether it's very old scout or whether it's as 18 or whether it's birthday bourbon or whatever and they get a little eyedropper out practically and they give you like it's nice to be able to pour a glass of whiskey and and enjoy it and not have to worry about when your next full glass, you know what I mean? Like, lean into it a little bit. Like, And, and that's that's fun for us because that's, that's the recreational drinkers and the celebratory drinkers that we are. Like, I go over to John Little's house and, you know, he's got rare stuff and I've got rare stuff, but if the grill's going and the music's going and people are coming in and out, it's like, Man, have you know? Try this, and not have to worry about. Oh well, I, I you know, I got to sip it as slowly as possible because I, I might not know where my next one's coming from. Like right. this one, again, Tuesday whiskey, man. There you go. So talk a little bit about the uh, contradiction as well. Like what, what what's the idea behind that? Because I know it's a it's a mixture of I think a bourbon and a rye. Is that what it's going for? No, it's a a weeded bourbon and a rye bourbon. Okay, all right. And so I the. Can, uh, that's where the contradiction comes in. Exactly. Well, it's it's multifaceted. So the idea was... I'm pretty sure Little told me, but I, I've got a short memory anyway. So. Well, you know, whatever. He's kind of an asshole, so whatever he told you... <laughs> as soon as he you, hears you this, can't, You can't necessarily go by that. <laughs> so, I love John, by the way. We really wanted to showcase 
what we thought was our ability to blend, our ability to pick really good whiskeys that complemented one another. And also at the time, there really weren't a lot of small producers who were blending stuff they make with stuff they don't make. You know, kind of the mantra was, well, here's what we make from scratch, and, you know, this is the only thing that's good. Or there were merchant ballers who were like, oh, we've got 12-year-old whiskey that's great, and don't ask too much about it, you know. But having sort of traded on this idea of celebrating merchant bottled whiskey, the idea was, well, let's take a whiskey we make that we think is really good and blend it with a whiskey that we don't make that we think is really good and sort of have uh, the resulting product be really kick-ass, really drinkable, really fun, and also in the labeling, just sort of, um, again, celebrate those two sides of our business without sweeping the details under the rugs. You know, and, and, and now that we, you even bring it up, I'm kind of mad. I don't even see the weeded whiskey here, the, your distillery only release, right? Oh, shit. Here it is. Here it comes. So he's going to bring it out of the back. Now I got Talking about this weeded, this weeded bourbon? Mm. That weeded bourbon. This is the one I actually haven't had a chance to try yet. So well, I'm, I'm actually excited for this. Listen. Oh, here. Oh, there you go. So talk a little bit about the weeded bourbon and kind of, uh, you know, what... What's going on with it and all that's kind of good so stuff. So pri primarily what we make back home is the weeder. We make, essentially now, Paul makes four mash bills back home. And um, it's, you know, weeded bourbon, rye bourbon, wheat whiskey, and rye whiskey. But but predominantly what we have of our own make in the Rick Houses is, is, is this mash bill. And we don't get the heat that, that Kentucky gets. So we think that it's going to be, going to take a little bit longer this is older than the first release of Weeded Bourbon. And this is really sort of a, a, an idea of what the batch two of the Weeded Bourbon will be. I really think it'll come into its own in about a year. And you may say, well, well, if you think it's gonna come into its own fully in about a year, why don't you just wait a year? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that is selfishly, I just wanna drink some. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're gonna sell at the gift shop. It's not that we're ashamed of it, but it is what it is. Yes. It's it's our weeder. It's a little bit young, but you know we're gonna bottle a little bit of it so we can enjoy it, and we can drink it and lean into it a little bit and kind of, you know, the only way that I think that you learn what a whiskey needs is to drink a little bit of it and understand how it plays uh, in the glass, how it plays in cocktails, how it plays with a rock or so. Yeah. Yeah. Now that you say it, yeah, it definitely it definitely has some of those younger notes to it. Um, I mean, you know, it's six year old. Weeder, so it's not three year old or two year old like the yearling was. Right. You know, we just think maybe it needs a little bit more heat, but I would do the Pepsi challenge with this against tons of other young bourbons out there oh, that, are, that are either, you know, 18 months old or three years old or they're older in a small barrel or whatever. And there's no disrespect to anybody that's trying to figure out their hustle and make their distillery work and pay their bills, but. Again, I, we're very proud of it. It's getting there. It's going to continue to get there, and you know, we we just want to drink a little bit of it. I, I don't disagree, right? I mean, how else would you know that if the market's ready to absorb it yet, unless you start testing it, right? That's that's the, that's the number one thing. I mean, I got a little trouble for saying that it was fucking delicious, <laughs> and I do think it's fucking delicious. Yeah. But you know, I think a lot of things are fucking but delicious. It's also your own baby too, right? Well, we, we're right. Not, we're not going to call our own kids ugly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, John, I want to say thank you again for yeah, uh, thank taking, you. taking a few minutes to talk to us about this. No, it's a real pleasure. Talk about more about your whiskeys. Uh, you know, everybody should know Smooth Amber by now. There's old scouts out there. You can still find some of their 10-year bourbons on the shelves. You just got to be in the right state to be able to find them. So uh, make sure you go and do that. Uh, John, thanks you again for, for coming on and just talking to us real quick. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Awesome. Thanks. Back again here at Whiskey Live, and we're with another one of my friends of the podcast, and Art Eatables. And this is easily the most delicious chocolate that you're going to find. And I, I guess, uh, first, how's the show going for you so far? It's been great. We have uh, had see a lot of regulars, which we love, but we've met a lot of new people. And, uh, of course, bourbon always brings people together, right? Yeah, so. And so this is Kelly, by the way. Kelly's our master chocolatier. And I guess, uh, talk to me about what I'm looking here on the on the floor right here, because I've, I've, I've got this, like, huge brick of chocolate, right? Okay, so 
So for, or, or fudge. It almost looks like it fudge It almost to me. looks like fudge, right. And it is pretty close to fudge, but it's the ganache that we use for our truffles. And uh, it is. It's a large brick that you can just sort of slice off heavenly pieces of bourbon chocolate and enjoy it with your bourbon. So. Oh, I mean, it's it's fantastic. So, you know, since we talked last time, I mean, what's what's been going on? Is How's business? Is it? I mean, what's been going on with it? Well, it's been sort of crazy. Uh, we've actually had several people coming in the store because they heard us on your podcast. There so we, we greatly go. appreciate that. Um, uh, since then, too, we've opened up a new location. We partnered with the uh, Fraser History Museum and the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. So we are now part of the trailhead of the Kentucky Bourbon Trail that starts in Louisville, Kentucky. So that's been keeping us really busy. And uh, we're getting to launch some products uh, with bourbon distilleries in D.C. So we've oh, been awesome. keeping it busy. Yeah. Oh, wait, so D.C., am I thinking Magnus? Am I? And you are All correct. All right, man. I didn't, that, wasn't, that wasn't a hard <laughs> guess. I know, but you know. Yeah, hey. <laughs> so that's awesome. I mean, you guys are growing. Uh, and not only that, I mean, what you're doing in, in the just the chocolate realm is just, I think it's a cut above the rest, right? It's it's better than what grandma can make with her bourbon, uh, uh, you know, desserts and all this other kind of stuff. But I, I guess if, if for people that didn't listen to your podcast, like give them an idea real quick of like what it is that you do and like the, the craftsmanship that goes into it or types of bourbon, like all those other kind of things, right? Okay. Well, as the world's only bourbon certified chocolatier, I take my bourbon real serious. So what I'm doing is I'm actually pairing those bourbons and spirits with chocolate to give you a bourbon experience outside the bottle. So the whole goal is that even if you don't drink bourbon, I always say you don't drink it yet, that if you try it through a chocolate, it allows you to try those, see those flavors, have that nuance, what it tastes, the finish, and you can have that all through a chocolate. And so that's really our, our goal is to get people to enjoy bourbon in one form or another. And ours just happens to be chocolate. And, and what you're doing is, uh, like I said, it's, it's fantastic, right? So like how much, how much bourbon is actually going into like, say a single truffle? Uh, well, we do have to stay I know, very I, legal. I know it's I know it's a big batch, <laughs> but let's let's just ballpark it, right? So each truffle, they would be less than, I mean, less than maybe a milliliter of alcohol. Like it's right. so small, um, but because that's where we really rely on the pairing is you want that flavor of the bourbon to come through, but you can't have all that alcohol. So people always ask us like, can I get drunk on these? Like. You would go in a sugar coma before you <laughs> ever got drunk. So, and it does sort of feel like being drunk. So, I don't know if that's your thing or well, whatever. <laughs> I tell you what, it sounds like a fun experiment. Uh, <laughs> we'll see you next time, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and so, I mean, the real cool thing about what you're doing, you're talking about expansion, is that like you can get these at uh, a lot of distilleries that are across uh, across the state, right? So, you're making them for uh, a lot of the big guys out there, uh, you know. And, and I guess kind of talk about like. What goes into each one that makes it just a little bit different or anything like that? Other than just the bourbon, right? Maybe there's... Well, a lot of it happens to do with the bourbon. Um, you know, a, a Jim Beam product is not going to taste like a Michter's product. And so you just sort of have to know what you're working with. Um, a, a lot of the Michter's products are really smooth. So I'm not going to pair that with too many dark, dark chocolates because that dark chocolate can overpower that bourbon. So. A lot of it does have to do with the bourbon, but it, again, it's knowing what I'm working with. Um, so, so you have to do a little bit of taste testing before to kind of know what kind of chocolate's going to pair well with I it. I do too. a lot of taste testing. I would um, think it's just, it's just a, I mean, it's just a part of the job. I, it really is. It's just like living <laughs> in the trenches. Exactly. Yeah. I, just, you know, I always, you know, I didn't think I'd ever start drinking every day for my uh, living, but that's what I do now, and it's uh, quite interesting and quite fun. Um, but I get to try a lot of cool stuff. And, um, you know, and again, it just makes me appreciate what I work with and do every day when I get to try these different um, spirits that are coming out all the time. The, um, the distillers are always looking for a different way to push the envelope. And so when they do that, it allows me to do even more as well. So, and that's what I love because they're pushing me and it, trying to give our co consumers a totally different experience. So. so last time we talked, it was around Christmas time, and you were doing your, was it the 28 days of Christmas, or what was 12 it? 12 days of bourbon. 12 days of bourbon. Yeah. Uh, so how, how well did that go, and give everybody that didn't listen kind of like an idea of what it is. Okay, so our 12 days of bourbon, we only do it once a year. Uh, we do pre-orders in November. We ship them out the 14th of December, um, and it's I take basically private bottles uh, from my own collection, hard to find rare bourbons, ones that don't exist anymore, um, that kind of thing, and I turn them into truffles. And so we limit it to 300 boxes, and that is it. And we sell out usually within two weeks of our pre-sales. 
So it's pretty cool. And then once people start listening to this, hopefully it's like in four days, right? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great way for people to say, like, you know, everyone's, you know, crazy about Pappy and not everyone's going to get it. But we were fortunate enough this year to get a 23. So we were allowed to share that with 300 people who would not have got to drink it. So it's that kind of thing. So it's my way of sort of sharing my loot with everybody else. That's real cool. That's real generous of <laughs> you because, I mean, it's way more generous than I'd be, I, I'd be honest with you. I'd, 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 I'd pour in, like, uh, yeah, some of the just Weller whatever and be like, oh, yeah, that was 23, all right. Like, yeah, you're not going to tell a difference, right? But, no, that's that's real cool that you're able to do that. And I, I think it's a it's a premium product that you're putting out there. And, and I think that everybody that has ever had one of your truffles always says it's, it's just one of the best things that you can especially get on the bourbon trail. You know, other than drinking the bourbon itself, if you want to start pairing it with something that's, uh, you know, a lot sweeter, you, you, you know, you need, you need something to kind of, like, cut up the day too a little bit and I think I think it's one of those good things and honestly my wife loves it so much she, every single time I like stop at a distiller she's like you think you can just pick up one like just the four packs or something like that just just four of them it'll get me through the weekend there you go I started an addiction for her and I apologize right. <laughs> that's so, awesome so Kelly I want to say thank you again for coming on real thank quick you. and talking to us time. this is uh, always a pleasure uh, real quick everybody got an idea of where they can find out more about you, where they can order online, all that kind of good stuff. Okay, so uh, our store locations are 631 South 4th Street, Louisville, Kentucky. We're also located at 819 West Main Street, Louisville, Kentucky. And they can find us at uh, arteatables.com. Well, fantastic. Thank you again for coming on. Thank you. Cheers. So back again here at Whiskey Live, and this time we've got another uh, old friend of the show. we got Brian Gelpo. Now, last time we had Brian on, Brian was talking to us a lot about makers, the ambassador program, but now he's a new ambassador. So, Brian, uh, kind of introduce uh, who you're working with now and uh, what's going on. So I'm currently the bourbon curator for Rabbit Hole Distilling. We're a new distillery located in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, being built on the uh, 700 East Block connecting Market and Jefferson in downtown Louisville. We've been contract distilling for a few years with another Kentucky distiller, but we're producing a four-grain bourbon and a uh, rye whiskey, and we're also doing some sourced product that we finish in Pedro Jimenez sherry casks. So you got a lot of stuff that's going on right now. We do. It's pretty busy. It's very exciting, though. I, and I think I think one of the, the most amazing thing about what you're doing here at Rabbit Hole, I mean, you're, you're starting to revitalize a lot of stuff that's had to start happening downtown and all that other kind of stuff, too, right? Yeah, so our distillery is being built in Nulu, not too far from the Angel's Envy Distillery. Uh, we should be distilling uh, by the end of the year. Our fermenters are in place. Our still is going to be delivered in August. Um, it's very exciting bringing life back to the Nulu area, a lot of restaurants and things. We're going to have a uh, restaurant and cocktail bar that's going to be run by the, the folks from Death & Co. out of New York City. Uh, they're pretty much credited with, with, with reviving the American cocktail. They literally wrote the book on the subject, so very exciting times. So I guess talk a little bit more about like the whiskeys and the bourbons that you're doing right now, right? So right where we have in our hand, we've got a, a rye, right? So this is our rye whiskey. Uh, it's a 95% rye, 5% malted barley. Most times when people hear that, they go, oh, it must be MGPI. It's not. This is, this is made in Kentucky, distilled in Kentucky, aged in Kentucky. I think a big difference is the Kelvin Cooper's barrels we're using. Okay. It's going to be unlike any rye you've tasted. Go well, for it. I guess, I guess that's a probably a good segue into actually trying it, right? So. It is unique. I mean, definitely you got that you got that spearmint bomb going on, right? You got a um, little bit of a cinnamon on the finish, almost like a red hot candy. Yeah, I can definitely see that. But it's not that um, you know harsh rye bite that you get with more like a bullet rye or some of the other 95.5s on the market. Yeah, I don't feel it like in the back of my cheeks or anything, right? I, I think this is going to be more of an everyday drinker as opposed to a cocktail rye. Which a lot of ryes are cocktail ryes because they're a little too harsh all on their own. So what are you guys what are you guys doing right now in regards of like how long are you, the, are you aging the products and uh, you know what what are you actually pushing out to market today? So that's the unique thing. We're trying to be as transparent as we possibly can. We do have a Kentucky straight bourbon and a Kentucky straight rye, which means if it's under four years old, we've yep. got to put our age statement on it. Yep. The rye you drank right here is about two years, nine months old. Our bourbon's about two and a half years old. Yeah, I mean, for a rye, I think the rye is fantastic, by the way, and even at two years, right? I think it's uh, it's easy. It's easy drinking. It I doesn't have that bite. It's definitely got a lot of like powerful flavor behind it, too, right? We're definitely aging up, though. We understand that. It's young. There's going to be more flavors and stuff that are going to come out the longer it ages. We think the rye is going to hit its peak at the four- to five-year range. Our bourbon probably in the five- to six-year range. And we're looking forward to taking the age statement off our bottle, unlike a lot of other distilleries. A lot of distilleries are getting credit or be critiqued right now because they're taking age statements off because they're going younger. 
Well, when we hit four years, that means we're going older. We're going to throw a party when we take our age statement off because yeah. we're finally going to be older. But we do think, like I said, four to five years on the rye, five to six years on the bourbon. I mean, I, I think it's great for what you're doing right now and, uh, and what's been going on. I, I mean, I, I guess, what, what can you close us out with here, right? Oh, and, and Fred Minnick is, is just now joining us Fred, in right Fred's here. Fred's bombing and, our interview. And, and, oh, are you guys doing an interview? No, no. But, but, I hold microphones all the time, Fred. But, but Fred is... I actually didn't notice that. I thought it was... Uh, don't tell me what you thought it was, Fred. There's <laughs> a PG-rated audience here, Fred. But, but the great thing, that Fred gives you a lot of accolades, right, about the good things that, that Rabbit Hole is actually doing. So, so I'll be honest with you. Fred is one of the most honest and toughest critics on the market, and he's had very good things to say about our rye whiskey positive things to say about our bourbon, so I'm happy with it. If you can please Fred, or Fred, that's a, that's a good day, right? It's not easy to please Fred, I'm telling you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave now. <laughs> no, uh, the rye whiskey, I scored it an 84 for Whiskey Advocate, which, you know, it's a pretty good score, I think. You know, I think 84 is pretty good. Uh, I like, you know, I'd like to see, uh, I can't wait for the rye with more age. And, um, you know, I thought the sherry barrel was pretty took over a little bit for the for for that release but i think in time it'll be, it'll get there so but you'll always get my honest opinion brian and but that's it and i always you know you know when i can't uh, make one of my events at the kentucky derby museum i ask brian to do it because uh I'd love to. i i really appreciate his uh, the way he gives presentations he's a great presenter and he, he, hold, he holds nothing back either right i mean he's he's honest right you can tell well, you're talking about transparency. Like, that's the biggest thing around here, right? That's what we're trying to do. And, again, that's why another reason why I like Fred so much, because he's very honest in his reviews. I don't need somebody to tell me they think something's great if it's not great. Because if it's bad and somebody doesn't tell me, then I'm not going to do anything to change it. So that's what I need to know. I need that brutal honesty. Right. Now here's the question. Are you going to leave Humana yet to go to Rabbit Hole full time? Th those discussions are still ongoing. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so Fred, thanks for joining in. Brian, Sorry thanks. About that. I didn't mean to. No, that's right, Fred. Fred. You're welcome anytime. Uh, but uh, Brian, I want to say thank you again for just taking a few minutes to just share a little bit more about Rabbit Hole. I mean, I think that everybody that's in in this area in Kentucky and Louisville knows about Rabbit Hole, and I think you guys are, are you're gonna make you're gonna make your footprint on the national page uh, relatively soon. So Rabbit Hole, the name, like, give it, give just gotta just lay it on straight. Like, what, where's the name come from? It's actually a pretty simple story. So I don't know if you've heard the background of our founder, Kaveh Zamanian. No, I haven't. Uh, long story short, he was a psychoanalyst for over 24 years, but he married a girl from Louisville, Kentucky. She happened to convert him to bourbon from being a scotch drinker, and he fell in love with it. When he fell in love with it, he got the idea he wanted to start his own bourbon company. So he was traveling around, going to all these different distilleries, looking at different locations. One day in the car, his wife looks at him and says, I can't believe you brought me down this rabbit hole with you. Bam, the name was created. There you go. Real cool. I think so. Kenny, thank you very much. Hopefully, as we get closer to opening our distillery, we can have you in, show you around. We're going to do a private barrel program at some point, so get you involved in that. But I appreciate all the support. You're doing great work over there at Bird Pursuit. We can't wait. Thank you again. Appreciate thank you. It. You're back again at Whiskey Live, this time with Beth Burroughs, another friend of the show. So How are welcome you? back. Thank uh, you. How, how's uh, you know, Whiskey Live and Bourbon Affair been for you so far this Absolutely week? Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, I actually kicked it off with the Bourbon queue at Fred's house, so we got to have a whole lot of fun. Flambeing some pork chops with a whole bottle of Booker's. All right. And yeah. We actually just talked to Fred, and he <laughs> and he threw the word flambe, and I'm just kind of like, all right, what does flambe actually so mean? So all of the pork chops lay on top of his grill, and then they literally will take a pork spout, throw it in a Booker's, and they just go over top of the whole thing, and it lights the fire underneath, so it caramelizes on top of all of those pork chops. Cor oh, okay, caramelized. I was like, yeah. I, I'm not a big griller per se. I like to barbecue <laughs> a little bit. And there may be like a proper term, but for me, that's what I think happens. And like, I, I can smoke a few things, but like when I when I think of that and just like fire coming up, I'm thinking like it's just going to get charred and burnt, but I didn't think it was going to get car yeah, caramelized nice there. light, just flame, and then it goes. It's, I have a boomerang over my phone if you'd like to see it. It's pretty fantastic. <laughs> well, cool. So I guess, um, you know, what else has been going on this week? Because, I, I, you know, you were... You were the cocktail person that was like, you know, you were doing a lot of that stuff at the uh, the Jim Beam experience when we were downtown. So so kind of talk about uh, any any big cocktails or any things you've been doing this week as well. Well, this week we haven't done a whole lot on the cocktail scene. It's been a lot more focused on the bourbon in and of itself. 
Um, so we did the train that actually went through the depots and ended up at the distillery. That was our big push for Bourbon Affair this year. Right. So we got to ride on a train with Fred and Freddie, and you got to taste through, do the famous Kentucky Chew and all that fun stuff, and just really introducing people to what it's like to be in bourbon country. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So uh, I poured myself a little, I mean, since we are at Whiskey Live, the, the great thing is that like, every, I mean, it's you have no shortage of anything you can possibly taste here. Agreed. Um, so I, I poured one of our favorites that we talked about last time you were on, which is the Bakers. Thank all right? you. So, uh, you know, talk, I guess give, give everybody else a, a kind of a recap of what it is that I'm drinking right here. So Baker's Bourbon, 107 proof, seven year old liquid. Should get some little bit of nuttiness on there. The viscosity is absolutely beautiful, coats your whole mouth, but not so much that it's too buttery. Um, you know, so you can get that next sip over. If you add a couple drops of water, those fruit notes come through. A little bit more of those uh, almondy notes come through as well. So it sips very, very smoothly. I, I want to say almost like a cognac, not quite as sweet as a cognac, but just easy as. Yeah. Um, and then scotch drinkers, to get them over to bourbon, we need something in between. You think that that's is the in between? Guy. I really do. In our portfolio, I think that's one of them, for sure. So, I mean, I guess because even here, there are a few scotch companies that can, you know, they are kind of treading in, uh, I don't want to say like shark infested waters, right, within bur no, bourbon country, had, right? But, we've got some in our portfolio as well that I find okay, absolutely that's fantastic. True. That's true. Akintosha and Lafroig, you know, the like of that. So, so cool. I mean, I, I enjoy it. I think it's really good. I, I don't know if I really see like the scotch into it, though, but it definitely is a nuttiness. I guess you say. It's, yeah. it's not necessarily a scotch. It doesn't have scotch characteristics, but I found that scotch drinkers and cigar smokers, people that are looking for something to cut through but not be too sweet, Baker's is where it's at. Well, that's awesome. Uh, I mean, I enjoy it. I think it's fantastic because it's it's easy sipping. I think with the either like a, just a half an ice cube or yeah. like just a few drops of, water, drops of water. I think it'll change its 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 flavor profile a lot. It does, and it just opens it up just a little bit more. Like I said, the fruit comes through a whole lot more, right. and it's I, it's my favorite. So you're stationed over here next to the the Knob Creek side of the house tonight. All right. So you got we got we got. It's actually like one big booth that we're sitting here we, looking we've got at. Like a whole little thing going on here, a little triangle of awesomeness with Jim Beam. Oh yeah, yeah. I guess Tory, there it is. Know. It's just right across the street over there. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, it's really cool that you guys are, are, are doing everything right here. I mean, I see, uh, now one thing I, I don't see here that I, I was kind of expecting is uh, Basil Hayden Rye, you know? Yep, we did not. We left that in the market for people to pick up. So that way it's going to the on-premise, going to the off-premise so that people can enjoy it there, more so than showcasing it here. There's not a whole lot to go around. So we want to make sure that it goes into your homes and your glasses and your bars. Well, awesome. Uh, again, want to say thank you for taking a minute and no talking problem. to us. This was fun. I you appreciate know, you having me. And cheers to the rest of your Whiskey Live. Cheers to you as well. So we're kind of finishing this off, and we got one of the past guests that it really, I think, might have put us on the map, right? And it put you on the map a little bit, too, because it was one of the most highly downloaded episodes of all time. So we got Bill Thomas at Jack Rose here. So, Bill, what's been going on since last time? First of all, I'm so grateful for that podcast because... More people have called me about whiskey since giving my number out at that podcast than <laughs> any other. It's been it's become one of my, and I, literally the first no the second deal I did in town this week was from the podcast. See, that's how you, you get know? that bourbon pursuit bump, right? That's how it works. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. I, it's crazy. You're you have a ton of followers, and they are big whiskey heads. That's for damn sure. Uh, and I think they I think they can appreciate for what you do, right? Uh, you know, for anybody that that doesn't understand what Jack Rose and maybe. They, Maybe they're they are idiots and didn't listen to the episode. Go ahead, tell them what Jack Rose and uh, you know your your store bur or your other bar bourbon and, right. and really what it is and, and how you're able to cater to a, a mass amount of people. Well, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, we were just big whiskey heads and we opened up our first whiskey bar bourbon, you know, uh, 15 years ago or so. I think now 16, um, just because we loved whiskey. And uh, now Jack Rose is kind of the end all be all to that. We have about 2,700 different bottles, you know, you know, celebrating American. We're, we're American whiskey fans, but we also have international single malts and, and Irish and everything. Um, but it's just been the last five years has been off the charts in terms of bourbon and the growth. So that's really been the focus. And that's why we're here in Kentucky about every three weeks now on buying trips. And, and it, just to give you an idea, I mean, from that deal that we got from Bourbon Pursuit, the gentleman who sold us one of those bottles, which we paid a good price for, we poured off for, for here today. There you, you know, go. so I mean, we you know we bought it and we immediately like we we kid you not when we told him, hey, he was like, listen, we don't pay, we you know we paid a good price, but we don't pay you top top as though we're going to stare it on your shelf. Right. It's like we actually poured this shit, and he actually came to the seminar. And we poured off his whiskey that we bought from him yesterday. That's fantastic. So, right. I mean, yeah. I, I think that's what that gives most people like the. Uh, I mean, the the good vibes about being able to sell to you, right? Because I mean, there's 
don't be wrong. Like, there's collectors and a lot of other stuff out there, but a lot of people they, they put this stuff on the shelves and then they're too scared to open it, right? Yeah, and yeah, that's what happens. Yeah, and I in some of the seminars we did today, we I kept telling horror stories about every time I buy a collection, there's four or five great old bottles, and not just prohibition bottles. I'm just talking about bottles from the '70s that have gone bad. So people need to drink whiskey. And I always say, you know, just find out who you want to drink it with. I'm not saying you have to be like, oh, tonight I'm going to open up this $1,000 bottle of whiskey or $500 bottle of whiskey. But I'm pretty sure you can find a couple dozen reasons a year to open up a really good bottle of whiskey. So I got a question for you, right? So let's say, let's say you're out in a buying trip and somebody says like, all right, I got this like 70s old granddad, but it's a little cloudy. Like what, what, what immediately comes to your mind right there? You should have opened it a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had to turn down a bottle since I've been here that was a little cloudy. It's just like, you know, it's just one of those things where it reminds you that drink your whiskey before it goes bad. I mean, it's, you know, I, you can, I can line up. I've got stuff at home. I did an article once. You know, I said, hey, the, all these bottles that are closed and sealed, it's like four or 5,000 bucks and it's all dead. Old tailors, old granddads. All the stuff that's just, yeah, it's just kind of at yeah. this point. I mean, is it, is it still drinkable? Is it still no. good? I mean, no, just at this point, it's just, it's just past its prime. No. I mean, it's not even like, no, yeah, no, it's not, man. It's just not. <laughs> Drink your whiskey. That's it. That's all it is. Well, that's that's yeah. a good thing to know. So uh, I guess, uh, what's the big reason for you to actually be here at Whiskey Live, right? Because I mean, you've got a you've got a booming business. Uh, you've, I mean, Jack Rose is on the map for a lot of whiskey geeks, right? I mean, I, I think I think you are trying to get more people on the map, but you're also doing something special here where you're giving specialty pours to a lot of people, right? Yeah, yeah, and I, I think the biggest thing today is we did find out that a lot of people that came here today hadn't even heard of Jack Rose. So this was important to come here to Kentucky and kind of, uh, you know, preach the gospel of Jack Rose. And a lot of people are like, hey, we, you know, we're scheduled to be in D.C. in a week, in a month, in two months. Uh, a lot of people have a reason to do business in Jack Rose. There's a lot of people that have, you know, some sort of office, uh, D.C. office that they have to go to once a year. And just coming here and getting that exposure and also, you know, meeting people that want to buy or sell whiskey or trade whiskey or just talk whiskey. You know, I learned things today. From the seminars that I gave, I actually learned from the people that were in the audience. And that's what's great about Kentucky. There's always somebody that knows something you don't know. And coming down every three weeks, I've just, I keep growing in terms of my knowledge of bourbon. And you have to come to the, the birthplace of bourbon, and that's Kentucky. So that's one thing that we actually wanted to try to do is uh, we actually, it was, it, was a, it was a mix of ideas, but it kind of, because uh, we wanted to record a lot of the things that actually happened today at the, at, uh, you know, the Higher Proof Expo, but kind of talk about what your, your session was about uh, and how you're either guiding people in the right direction to make the right purchases or... Hey, sell, sell to me because you know you can trust me, right? Right, right, right. I mean, there's you're always like, you're like the best greasy car salesman out. I am, I am. I, I'm <laughs> slick back. I, it, it's sad, but I do. I, I try to buy. I do try to pay a fair price. Um, and you know, we, here we are. We're giving all this advice on what to do. And you know, we always tell people like, listen, if you don't sell it, I mean, we always when people ask me for appraisals and stuff, I'm like, well, first drink it. And if you don't want to drink it, this is what it's worth, and I will buy it from you. And I always say also, if you're like, well, I wouldn't, I, I'm not gonna drink a $500 bottle. And I was like, well, then sell me the $500 bottle and go buy 10 bottles of shit you would drink and you don't feel bad about, you know? So, I mean, there's, you don't have to just feel like, you know, I shouldn't be drinking a $500 bottle. And let's face it, that $500 bottle probably cost you $7.99 in 1979. Right. So freaking just open it as though it's $7.99, but I understand you don't want to. And definitely getting into a place like Jack gives a lot more people the chance to appreciate it and, uh, I think that's what it is. I mean, you can't afford to buy a whole bottle now. Bourbon's just skyrocketed. And also, you can't afford to buy whiskeys that you really don't know if they're good or bad. So you got an opportunity to try something for 20 bucks or 30 bucks instead of spending 300 bucks. You can either say, okay, now it's worth going out and buying a bottle. Uh, for instance, Decades, the new Wild Turkey. Yeah. I thought it was really good. So I went to a liquor store where I was here, and I was like, I will take a six-pack of that. So I bought it. <laughs> and they were like, you want a, you want a, a what? Like, yeah. sure, absolutely. Yeah, they were. And then we got to the front. And you're like, hey, you know, we're sampling it over here at this table. And I go and I went over and sampled it. I was like, this is really good. I was like, I will take two six pack of this. So it was amazing. I thought it was one of the best Wild Turkey releases in a while. Yeah, I, I agree. Know? I mean, thankfully, I was actually given a, a, a bottle as a, a courtesy and, and talking about it in the podcast and stuff like that. But I, I was honestly surprised by it, too. I, I thought for what it was, it was one of the better Wild Turkey releases that there has been. You know, yeah. I think I think what they're doing, the Russell Single Bill program is by far one of the uh, it's one of the premier things that, you know, it, it flies underneath the radar of a lot of whiskey geeks, too, because everybody's like going crazy. They're either 107 and stuff. But right. like, but Russell's Reserve, for some reason, I mean, it's a solid bourbon. You get single barrels, you get something that's very unique but it flies underneath the radar of a lot of people. You know, I think the problem with Wild Turkey is a lot of people take it for granted because it's been so 
well produced for so many years and you haven't you've had that continuity of the Russells that you know it just sells and the people love it love it but they haven't done all the different special releases that get all the hoopla but for the guys who drink whiskey they know how good wild turkey is but they also know they can always count on it being there so there oh, hasn't yeah. been the rush but now you're right there's been this new discovery of all these single barrels and now you know I've been buying up single barrels when I go to different liquor stores and just interested in trying them and the breadth and depth of the wild turkey has been amazing so how, like, since the last time we talked, like, uh, I mean, you guys are on buying expeditions all the time. So, like, how big is the portfolio gone since the last time we talked? Big enough. We got a storage unit here now. Uh, see? Yeah. All right. So yeah, since, uh, since the last time, yeah. So there's uh, hint, hint, wink, wink. Yeah. Um, so if, <laughs> if you can if you can read between the lines, there there may be, there may be a... a Maybe a reason for the for the whiskey to stay in Kentucky. Let's put it that see. Way. There we go. So <laughs> we're not gonna we're not gonna talk about it too much. But if you're in the know, you, you might you might know that uh, there might be a, some doors opening at some point. But yeah. uh, you know, I think I think everybody's really looking forward to that because the laws did change here, right? And I think uh, it's prime time for a uh, you know a lot of bars to really start embracing that because uh, you know being able to sell a, a vintage whiskey here in Kentucky keeps keeps people in Kentucky part of the bourbon trail and they just don't have to always go to DC to be able to do it too yeah and and I'm not trying to undercut myself but I tell you what if I could have one more reason to spend you know instead of spending uh, one week of every month in Kentucky maybe two or three weeks of every month I'd be pretty happy with it there we go so so Bill I want to say thank you again for coming on today it's a pleasure just talking to you my pleasure and thank you for pouring me some of your uh, your Maker's uh, 46 special blend right here yeah yeah it's always it's a a good one but I think I can do better next time I'll I, I got I already got ideas. I should change a few staves here. So there we go. So so. Blending whiskey is a tough job now. I realize how hard it is. So, so we, there there are people that call master blenders at all these places, right? They get they get that title for a reason. I tell you what, man, having the palate and being able to pick the barrels and put them together and not screw it up is truly an art. And anybody who doesn't think creating a small batch or or you know a small batch of six barrels or a small batch of a hundred barrels. It's insane. It is an art, and it needs to be as important as master distiller, master blender is right there. Awesome. So, well, Bill, thank you again for coming on. Uh, pleasure. And I, I think we're going to get you on again at some point again and just do another. Uh, we're just going to p- pick your brain and let you rant for another hour. Yeah, yeah. And I'll be back in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Pleasure. Thanks again, right. Bill. Thanks. Bye.